Hello, everyone. Good afternoon on this uh, beautiful day. I'm glad that we managed to escape uh, the the rain. Um, let me just get uh, get my notes from flying away here, and uh, we'll get started. Comme toujours, je suis ici uh, sur uh, le territoire uh, de Mississauga, Anishinaabe. Onoshone, a Huron Wendat. As always, I'm here on the traditional territories of the Mississauga of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Onoshone, and the Huron Wendat. I'm also here in wonderful Moss Park. As I promised you, I would be taking you on a tour of the country, in fact, a tour of the world, just here in Toronto Centre. Moss Park is one of the most, it's really a city within the city. It's one of the most uh, diverse uh, places in Canada. Uh, we have many newcomers in this community. We have many frontline workers, many essential workers, many of the things that uh, our country uh, is confronting now, you can see unfolding in this wonderful, resilient and incredibly generous community. Um, nous sommes ici uh, en Moss Park, à Toronto, en Toronto Centre. Une communauté qui est tellement généreuse, uh, tellement, um, tellement, um, uh, tellement uh, impliquée uh, dans la vie de uh, leurs voisins et voisines. Uh, une communauté inc incroyablement diverse aussi, avec beaucoup de, de nouveaux Canadiens et Canadiennes, um, avec beaucoup de travailleurs essentiels aussi, uh, qui font le travail uh, pour assurer que notre économie fonctionne pendant la pandémie. Uh, today we are here to to share. I'm here to share some thoughts uh, about uh, where we head next as a country in terms of ensuring that people and communities like Moss Park are taken care of as we finally begin to emerge from the pandemic. Uh, and today is a is a special day for me, and it's actually a, a day when I was preparing my thoughts for today uh, that was particularly poignant because. My sister, my younger sister, is in the hospital as we speak, giving birth to her first child. Um, she is uh, my only sister, and we are a very close family. Uh, today, my mother and myself would have loved to have been in the hospital to support my sister through her birth and to be there to greet uh, a grandson and a, um, and, uh, a new nephew. Uh, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to do that. Because even though some people seem to have forgotten, including the Liberal government, we are still in the midst of the fourth wave of a pandemic. And I can't go to the hospital to see my sister today. We're not allowed to be there. And we have seen so many families separated by this terrible virus that cannot celebrate these important moments together. That has not ended. And we have to make sure that something good comes of all of this. Les séparations des familles, les sacrifices, ça doit uh, valer la peine uh, au final. Uh, on doit assurer qu'il y a de très, um, quelque chose de bien uh, qui sort de tous uh, ces sacrifices. Uh, and staying on the theme of, of my family, some of you will know that my father died uh, during the pandemic. And again, because it was during the first wave of the pandemic, his family was not there at his bedside. Uh, he died an avoidable death from a treatable infection in long-term care in the first wave. And he is one of many uh, who died in facilities that were understaffed, in facilities where the hard-working personal support workers, many of whom live in communities like this one, were overworked. Uh, my sister, who is in the hospital today and who uh, will not be able to introduce her child uh, to her father, when uh, when my father ended when my father passed away she called me in tears and i've told this story before and said to me anime we have got to do better we have got to know what a life is worth and so as we confront these unprecedented ch uh, challenges of our time and as we look to a future beyond the pandemic this is the question that we must keep our minds fixed on what is a life worth because we must make sense of this moment by taking the lessons learned to build a more resilient and just society and to ensure a life 
of dignity for everyone from their first day to their last day. This election to me is about that. It is about whether we are going to be able to ensure life with dignity for every person who lives in Canada. Because I've been sharing some numbers with all of you and I'm going to share some more today and remind you of some. 15,000 plus deaths in long-term care, over 15,000 deaths in long-term care, the worst record amongst wealthy nations by far. 17 drug poisonings per day on average, many of them which occur steps away from where I am standing now. 17 drug poisonings per day on average in Canada. Thousands of homeless, and if the cameras pivot in the other direction, they can practically see the encampment in Moss Park, where we have neighbors in our community that have nowhere to live and no community supportive uh, housing. So 15,000, 17, and thousands more. We cannot allow these numbers to become commonplace in Canada. People of, in Canada have said they do not want to go back to the way things were. That we do not want to allow people to die avoidable deaths. That we do not want to push our planet to the brink and to leave our children's future in danger. We do not want people to go without jobs and without safe housing. We are waking up to the fact that if we continue to elect the same parties who have made the same old promises um, and hope for different results, that we can only expect more of the same. C'est le moment de faire un différent choix si on veut voir des différents résultats. And so the Green Party understands this. And as we talk about climate justice, and we will continue to talk about climate justice, we fully understand that there can be no climate justice without social justice. And to quote uh, Nobel Prize winner Joseph Stiglitz and the former Chancellor of the Exchequer, Sir Nicholas Stern, any recovery, including a, cli a climate-friendly recovery, is unlikely to be implemented unless it also addresses existing societal and political concerns such as poverty alleviation, inequality, and social inclusion. So that is really just a more elaborate way of saying that there cannot be climate justice without social justice. The two must go hand in hand, and they must go hand in hand now. And so over the days to come, we will be talking in more detail about our plan for life with dignity in Canada. Uh, today, I'll share some of what those elements are because the Green Party of Canada believes that we have the chance of a lifetime and we are offering the plan of a lifetime to lay the foundations for a better future um, for social care in Canada. These elements include long-standing green policies which have proven their worth throughout this pandemic. These ideas that we have put into the political discourse before the pandemic have shown proof of concept and would have had us better prepared had they been in place when the pandemic struck and they will leave us better prepared in the future uh, if they exist. First, and again in no particular order because these are all interconnected, we need a radical reform of long-term care in this country. Root root to stem reform of long-term care in this country. We need to see long-term care reforms and wrapped into our Canada health system. We need a guaranteed livable income, something whose time has come. There is no patchwork system that will ever replace a guaranteed livable income. And as we exit emergency benefits, this is part of the solution. Affordable housing for all and an end to homelessness. This is absolutely something that is within our grasp, something that we have all the tools necessary to do as long as we can get the political will to put it in place because housing is a fundamental right. And then the creation of new universal programs because it is time to complete our social safety net. It is time to finish the unfinished business of so many years ago. This includes universal pharmacare, universal childcare, free, 
free post-secondary education, universal dental care, and any of the other universal programs that would ensure that people are protected from their first day to their last. Now, you know, I recognize that there are those, uh, well, I know, I've heard it, I've had the questions, you know, why are you I think they lost the Wi-Fi. Ils ont perdu le, la connexion de Wi-Fi. Alors, si vous pouvez patienter quelques minutes, they, they will be back in a minute. They're just trying to get reconnected to Wi-Fi. livable income is the best way to address the ills in our society that you've spoken about. <laughs> Thanks for the question, David. And there's this Caribbean expression, and there are a lot of people from the Caribbean that live behind me here in Moss Park. You say, a time, you know, when something's time has come, you say, a time, a time. And uh, this is an idea whose time has come. It is, has, has garnered tremendous cross-partisan support. It is a policy that is supported by the membership through approved policy, through appro approved policy resolutions uh, in our party, in the NDP, uh, and also in the Liberal Party. We had 50 senators signing up uh, to a joint uh, request, a joint pledge for guaranteed livable income. This is something that transcends party lines exactly because we realize that after all of these years, after these decades of patchwork systems, we saw very clearly at the pandemic that we still have not accomplish the goal that we should be aiming toward, which is to ensure that every person in Canada is protected come what may and can have a life of dignity. And so we, there are models all over the world. And frankly, the, um, uh, the one of the things that Canada had been best at was uh, looking to other examples and, and learning from them. If we learn from the models of other countries, we certainly can bring in a guaranteed livable income without too much of a delay. And we need to because, as I said, the benefits are drying up. The emergency benefits will go away and people will begin to fall through the cracks again. We can't allow that uh, to happen and guaranteed livable income is a part of that. So let's get together. Let's discuss it with the provinces. Let's see how we can make it happen. Um, there's more than enough uh, information now for us to move forward quickly. 
And I welcome the NDP to the Guaranteed Livable Income family. When I was speaking about Guaranteed Livable Income in the 2019 election, um, there were just crickets from the other parties. And this is an example of how the Green Party puts ideas out there that prove their worth over time and uh, that move us forward in this country. We are the home for the innovative progressive policy ideas. And so I say welcome to the NDP and let's get to work. Part of the hesitancy from, you know, going full throated into a, a guaranteed livable income is that you've had uh, studies that have been done by expert panels, such as out in BC, that have determined that you can't possibly have a universal program that could address all the social issues in a community and a society. Essentially, you can't just use a one size fits all approach to tackle such complex issues. So I'm just wondering, what is your response to that? What is your response to those expert panels that just say that what you're promising from this, these sorts of programs, you just won't be able to deliver it? Mm -hmm. Well, I would say they're right. Uh, one size fits all, uh, fits uh, almost no one at all. And that is not at all what is being proposed. First, let me say that for everything that I mentioned today, we are going to be providing uh, a greater detail we really pride ourselves in being an evidence-informed party. We consult with the leading experts and stakeholders before we formulate any of our policies, which is why so many of them, as I said, over time show their value and proof of concept because they really are based in best practices and best knowledge. Uh, so we will be talking more about guaranteed livable income, but let me say, there was never and has never been amongst those who are proponents of GLI any suggestion that this is going to be a replacement for all of the other social programs that exist. Uh, that is absolutely not what is being proposed at all. And I think that that was a fundamental um, misunderstanding by, uh, by the uh, BC um, professors who put, uh, put together that report. This is intended to be uh, the, the net the thing that, that people can count on uh, when other things fail and when they cannot be served by existing social programs because we see that uh, they can't. This is something that is going to eliminate the stigma that is associated with so many social programs right now. This is the thing that is going to allow us to confront other big challenges like the change, like the future of work that is being caused by automation and artificial intelligence, like the transition away from fossil fuels. It's the thing that will let people breathe and have confidence to make choices about their lives and taking care of loved ones in times of need. Uh, so this is absolutely part of the package that needs to emerge from the pandemic. And I'm very excited to share more information with people about it, but it absolutely is not intended and would never be designed in a way to leave anyone worse off uh, than they are now. Thank you so much. We'll now hand it over to Rosie Emery, Press Secretary for the Green Party of Canada. Yes, we have a question here. On a question de Vincent Gosselin de Radio VM. Allez-y, Vincent, s'il vous plaît. Oui, merci beaucoup. Bonjour, Madame Paul. Bonjour. Euh, J'aimerais savoir, j'aimerais entendre en français votre position sur la vaccination obligatoire pour les fonctionnaires fédéraux. Et dans un cas où un fonctionnaire refuse de se faire vacciner, pour vous, quelles devraient être les conséquences appliquées par le gouvernement fédéral? Merci pour la question. En fait, nous avons euh, préparé une déclaration aujourd'hui qui est disponible sur notre site Web. Euh, comme j'ai dit hier et le jour avant hier, euh, Uh, la question des vaccinations uh, pour les fonctionnaires ou pour uh, non, les autres uh, employés d'ailleurs, c'est une question très importante, c'est une question uh, qui vaut uh, une considération importante. Uh, uh, tout uh, tout d'abord, je veux dire que les vaccinations sont essentielles. Uh, ils ont fait preuve d'être une, 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 um, une partie clé uh, de notre uh, lutte uh, contre la pandémie. Uh, on encourage chaque personne uh, qui peut avoir une vaccination de l'avoir uh, le plus tôt possible parce qu'on sait qu'on a une, une quatrième vague. On, on voit le, le, on doit assurer uh, que la quatrième vague est, est la dernière vague et les vaccins uh, font une partie clé de ça. Um, mais on sait aussi qu'il y a des gens pour des raisons de santé, pour des raisons culturelles, pour des raisons uh, religieuses uh, qui continuent à désiter. 
ou, ou, ou même refuse d'avoir les vaccins. Et on sait très bien que uh, une politique créée par le gouvernement fédéral um, pour uh, les fonctionnaires fédéraux doit respecter um, les, um, les droits fondamentaux uh, des fonctionnaires et doit uh, trouver une manière uh, de protéger tous les travailleurs et travailleuses uh, au même moment uh, de ne pas um, de ne pas violer uh, uh, ces droits fondamentaux. Le premier ministre um, le sait bon. Monsieur Trudeau le sait, sait très bien aussi. Alors, nous, on attend de voir les, les détails. Et je crois que c'est clair de ce qui a été publié l'autre jour, que le gouvernement fédéral va préparer un plan qui inclut les vaccinations et une, une demande que les fonctionnaires soient vaccinés, mais au même moment, um, une alternative pour les gens qui, uh, qui ne peuvent pas um, ou ne veulent pas pour des raisons uh, culturelles, religieuses, etc., à se vacciner. En suivi, euh, j'aimerais savoir plus précisément, là, parce que le chef du NPD aujourd'hui a laissé entendre qu'un fonctionnaire pourrait ne pas pouvoir travailler s'il refuse de se faire vacciner. Euh, Êtes-vous prêt à aller jusque-là? Quelles conséquences directes il devrait y avoir? C'est une très intéressante question et position, en, en fait, parce que euh, il y a, à ah nous, il y a des, des, uh, des accords collectifs, uh, il y a des syndicats. Um, C'est pas vraiment pour, um, um, pour uh, uh, M. Singh uh, ou les autres partis de dire ça. C'est une uh, conversation entre les syndicats uh, et, uh, et uh, le, le, le gouvernement. Um, alors, uh, pour nous, comme j'ai dit, uh, c'est tellement, je suis tellement déçue que le gouvernement a, a, a clairement décidé de d'essayer de créer une, 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 un enjeu pour ces, ces élections, à quand on devrait concentrer sur comment nous allons créer le meilleur politique pour les fonctionnaires et les autres employés, um, le, le plus sûr um, et le plus sécuritaire. Um, on sait très bien qu'il y aura des exceptions pour une raison ou d'autre, même pour des, 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 um, des exceptions médicaux. Um, alors, il faut avoir une alternative. Um, on sait aussi qu'il y a des droits fondamentaux qui sont en jeu. On sait aussi qu'il y a des personnes, même dans une communauté comme uh, ceci, en Moss Park, qui um, font partie des communautés um, qui, historiquement, ont eu des très um, um, mal um, um, engagement, um, c'est pas engagement, um, relation avec le système de santé. Um, et ils hésitent. Alors, est-ce que nous allons les éduquer, les encourager, leur donner des raisons pour se faire vacciner ou est-ce que nous allons les punir? Um, moi, je sais que c'est sûr que n'importe quelle politique acceptée par les syndicats, surtout pour les, par les syndicats, va, va être une politique qui doit respecter les, uh, les droits fondamentaux uh, des fonctionnaires. Merci, Madame Paul. Merci, Vincent. Are there any other questions online? Est-ce qu'il y a d'autres questions sur uh, Zoom? Before before we go, then let me just introduce to you uh, Phil De Luna. Uh, Phil De Luna is our candidate in um, Toronto St. Paul's, and a shining example of what um, what we hope to bring to Ottawa in terms of green MPs. Uh, Phil was the youngest ever uh, director at the National Research Council, and if elected, he would be the first the um, the first Filipino man from Ontario. Uh, sent uh, to our uh, our parliament. Uh, he took six months off uh, in order to present himself as our candidate. He is an extraordinary person, an incredibly thoughtful person with groundbreaking ideas, uh, particularly around uh, the climate. And so, uh, as I said to, as I said before, take a look and see who's running in your community for the Greens. I think you'll find someone extraordinary, someone incredibly committed uh, to the community, and that would be a compelling voice for your community in Ottawa. Yay, Phil! <laughs> you know, if you're going to be back there, you know, let's, uh, you know. <laughs> Rosie, back to you. Uh, we don't have any more questions okay. in the Zoom room, so I'm handing it back to Victoria. Thank, Thank you very, you very much. much. Merci à tout le monde pour venir. Merci beaucoup. Thank you, everyone.